Hey everyone, I'm Mikael. Um, we're talking about our work on neural networks for abstraction and reasoning. Um, so we'll start by talking about the ARC dataset that you've actually already heard about a couple times today, and then two very different approaches uh, for tackling it. So ARC was first introduced in 2019 um, by Francois Chalet. He was looking for a measure of machine intelligence that can be evaluated um, objectively and automate in an automated way um, to make a benchmark. And the goal was basically to try and spur progress um, in this domain in much the way that ImageNet did for image recognition. Um, and he reasoned that intelligence could be summarized as the ability to generalize to previously unseen tasks and how efficiently a system can learn to do those tasks. And this idea has been around for a while. Previous works like the Bongard problems over 50 years ago test similar skills. Um, but what made ARC really good was much larger data set, consistent structure, and a defined evaluation procedure. So ARC consists of 900 of these handcrafted tasks on variable sized grids of pixels, um, split into three data sets. Uh, this work focuses on the, the two public data sets. Here's an example of an ARC task. Um, they all look like this. Basically, you're given a handful, maybe three training examples, each which represents the same transformation between an input grid and the output grid. Um, so in this example, what you need to do is fill in uh, the enclosed areas at the top uh, with yellow. And your job, or the computer's job in this case, is to learn that transformation and apply the same one to the test example to produce the missing grid. And you've got to get that exactly right to score a point. And what's interesting is that everyone in this room could easily solve most of these problems, but computers are really bad at this sort of stuff. Uh, now, it's very easy to write a program to rotate an input grid or uh, fill in yellow or whatever it is, but it's hard to build a machine learning model or any program for that matter that can learn to do rotation or this arbitrary task from just a few examples. And that's the sort of analogy reasoning we've heard about today. So in each task, there's 10 to the 900 possible answers. Um, you have to get it exactly right, and you've about, got about three examples. So from like a traditional classification perspective, it's a bit intractable. And since 2019, there have been four competitions to try and solve ARC. Um, at the time of this work, uh, every high-scoring approach relied on handcrafted rules combined with brute force search, so no machine learning. So what sort of algorithms can we use for a problem like ARC? Um, the first one we're going to look at is one called DreamCoder from um, Professor Tannenbaum's group at MIT, who was here earlier. Now, DreamCoder is a program induction algorithm. So what that means is that rather than us trying to find that missing grid directly, we want to write a program that performs a transformation that matches the training examples. If we can find such a program, we can then just apply it to the test input, get the test output. And we can reduce the search space to the length of that solution program. DreamCoder is also described as a neurosymbolic programming algorithm. That basically means we use deep learning to help with the program induction. Um, and there are three phases to the algorithm called waking, dreaming sleep, and abstraction sleep um, to do continuous improvement. And we'll talk about that now. So the waking phase, this is the program induction step. Um, at first, it's literally brute force search. So we have a domain-specific language. Um, it'd be intractable to sort of enumerate Python, for example. So we enumerate all possible programs in order of complexity, check them against the task. If we find one that matches the training examples, then we submit it. Um, and yeah, we need a DSL uh, where solutions to ARC tasks are as short as possible, and at the same time, uh, needs to be sufficiently general so that it can solve tasks that we've never seen before. Um, for ARC, we built one, gave it a nice acronym called Perl. It's basically a well type language with 81 different primitives that are useful for ARC, uh, largely inspired by that previous handcrafted work. Um, here's some examples at the bottom. So color manipulation, um, splitting an uh, object and uh, performing operations on them, um, counting pixels, stuff like that. Next, we're going to look quickly at the dreaming sleep phase of DreamCoder. So brute force search only gets us so far. Um, so what we do is we train a recognition model which takes in an arc task and outputs a grammar. And in that grammar, we assign the, well, the model assigns probabilities to each primitive based on the likelihood of that primitive appearing in the solution to the task. And this is sort of the role of human intuition. Um, if you look at an arc task, you're immediately going to be able to see, like, okay, this is something to do with manipulating objects, or okay, this is a rotation, this is coloring in, whatever, even if you don't know exactly what the solution is yet. Um, and if we can prune that search space, we can dramatically improve that performance. 
Um, each task has many different grids um, of different sizes, aspect ratios. So we can't use a off-the-shelf CNN for this. Um, we've got a fully convolutional net um, that basically can take any grid, any sorry, task of any size and produce a single fixed width embedding for that task. How do we train such a model to suggest solutions? Uh, Arc only has 800 examples. None of them are labeled with uh, Perl programs, and I didn't feel like writing all that myself. So we don't have enough training data. Um, Dreamcoder does something called dreaming. That's where the name comes from. Um, and what we do is we randomly sample input grids from Arc, um, and we randomly generate Perl programs, and then use that to generate an output. That's now a new Arc task we've created, and it's labeled. And we can do this as many times as we want. The recognition model is trained to invert that pro process, so it recovers the program from the generated task. Um, we find that this uh, allows Dreamcoder to solve Arc tasks about 10 times faster. Here's an example of an Arc task solved by Dreamcoder. Um, in this case, on the left here, the solution to go from the top to bottom is to hollow out the interior of each object. Perl hasn't got a primitive to do this, um, but Dreamcoder is able to figure out what it can do is it draws a border around the objects, and then it draws a border around that border, which happens to be include the inside, and then uses that as a mask on the original image um, to produce the result. In another example, um, Dreamcoder comes up with, it makes a lambda function to set the background of uh, a grid to orange, and then applies that to each object in the grid um, to basically make these uh, squares that you see on the left. Now, overall, uh, Dreamcode is able to solve 17% of Arc easy tasks and 5% of Arc hard tasks. And this is a three times improvement over the previous uh, work uh, on Dreamcoder by Alfred et al. Um, but it significantly lags behind that handcrafted solution uh, we talked about earlier, which can solve almost half of these tasks. So what about large language models? Um, I heard that large language models have pretty good emergent reasoning abilities on text. Um, so can we transfer that to logic puzzles? Now, LLMs obviously can't handle art grids uh, natively. Um, we could try some stuff with visual language models, but then there's a question of how do you get them to output a pixel perfect uh, grid? So what we did is we converted uh, each task with one token per pixel um, and basically just fed that into various LLMs, um, asking it to basically complete the final output. Um, and of course, LLMs, you, you know, they're doing reasoning in one dimension. A lot of Arc tasks require reasoning in two dimensions, or it helps at least. So what we do is we provide each task three times in a rotated and transposed way, um, and that dramatically improves performance as well. So the performance, model, uh, performance scales quite well with model size. Uh, GPT-4 was able to solve 15% of Arc tasks across the board, which is slightly better than Dreamcoder. Um, Here's an example of, of a specific task. Um, we can see scaling uh, sort of help quite consistently. Um, as parameter count increases, number of errors decreases, um, and small models struggle to output a grid at all. These white, uh, white squares on the left are where it's got the grid size wrong. Um, but in this case, Llama 65B finally gets the correct answer. I'll touch on this briefly. Um, we looked at some, like, Ensemble analysis, um, it's interesting to see that different DSL-based methods uh, tend to work quite well on similar tasks, but LLMs actually are quite good at very different set of tasks. So there's only a 37% overlap between Dreamcoder and GPT-4, and as a result of that, ensembling would help quite a lot. So where does this leave us? Um, overall, both LLMs and Dreamcoder show promising improvements over previous ML-based approaches. The research landscape was quite barren on that. Um, however, far behind uh, the solution by IceCuba, that previous handcrafted solution that we mentioned, um, personally, I was quite surprised by how well LLMs are able to do just zero shot. Um, and it's encouraging that different approaches have different strengths. And since this work was released just a few weeks ago, uh, there was another competition. And there's a new state-of-the-art set using LLMs as a core. Um, basically doing test time fine tuning, um, and I highly recommend uh, checking out that work. So there are many possible avenues for improvement here. Um, with Dreamcoder, is definitely quite sensitive to the choice of DSL, 
Um, the recognition model is also quite small. Like both of these things could e definitely be scaled up. There's a lot of other things that could be done like execution guided synthesis where the partial solutions are, are built upon. On the LLM side, of course, we just did a zero shot um, analysis. There's lots of reasoning frameworks, fine tuning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I think is really interesting is the intersection between these methods. Um, you know, LLMs are good at, uh, at reasoning, but they're not very good at outputting very long lists of numbers with making zero mistakes. Um, so it'd be interesting to see, can you use an LLM on some intermediate representation of the task that it's perhaps more suited for, or use it during the program induction step or the recognition model step of something like DreamCoder um, and sort of get the best of both worlds. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mikkel, for that very interesting talk. Um, any questions for Mikkel? Yep, go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the interesting talk. Thank um, you. I'm curious for the, the recognition model you mentioned earlier, how you decided on the uh, convolutional architecture um, that you used. Yeah, so basically, these grids can be one by one. They can be 30 by 30. Uh, you might be tempted to just be like, oh, I'll get a ResNet or whatever and I'll just scale them up or down. But it's the size of the grid really makes a big difference to the task and aspect ratio and so on. So um, basically we had to have the model that got, has like a, can, can handle all the way down to one by one inputs and has like a fixed size output. Um, and then what we do is we have, uh, we apply that on each of the input and output grids separately and we calculate the residual, the idea being that the difference between them, the idea being that um, it's the difference between the input and output that we're actually trying to get. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks, Mikkel. Uh